And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a simulcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevik. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, including our partnership uh, with YouTube. Carol, stocks off session lows, but still we're talking about 80% of the S&P right now deep in the red. Yeah, broad-based selling, right? No doubt about it. So a very different tone here. And it has to, you know, I just keep looking at the rates market and where that 10-year, what, above 4.6 holding there. Uh, again, it makes me think, Tim, okay, do, you know, equity investors have to once again rethink valuations in a higher for longer and getting higher, it feels like, when it comes to the Treasury trade. Well, we just spoke to Ryan Carson over, or Ryan Dietrich, rather, over at the Carson group. Um, and you guys know him. I mean, he called it last year. He got it right last year, Scarlett. Um, he's still extremely bullish. And he said, OK, he called the what we're seeing right now, quote unquote, indigestion in the market. And that, you know, some type of pullback, five to eight percent, given the run up that we've seen since October, would not at all be surprising. But if this economy avoids a recession, which he thinks it will, um, then he stays bullish. Indigestion is a kind way of putting it, given how big the losses are today. We, um, what's interesting here, of course, is that we thought we saw most of the selling on Friday, given there was so much anticipation of some kind of attack over the weekend. We got it, and there was a little bit of a relief yeah. initially, but that, that didn't hold. So, I mean, how much are we going to be on tenterhooks for the rest of the week? Because there might be a response from Israel, but then how does Iran respond to that? I feel like we're just going to be in, in this churn for a while. Yeah, and we should point out, too, I mean, when you sort of pair this with the decline that we had on Friday here, I mean, this is the biggest uh, two-day drop that we've seen in the markets going back uh, to late October, at least uh, for the NASDAQ and the S&P here. So I, I think that's uh, maybe a little bit different complexion than maybe some of the other sell-offs we've seen where we kind of had a one and done and then everybody's back in the pool. Not today with the Dow Jones Industrial Average lower by about 250 points or about seven-tenths of a percent. The S&P going to fall about 62 points roughly, uh, down about 1.2 percent and back below 5,100, 5,061 and change as we wait for these numbers to settle. The NASDAQ composite lower by about 290 points or 1.8 percent. And let's take a look at the Russell 2000. The cyclicals down about 1.4 percent here on the day, down 20 seven points. Right. And the S&P 500 uh, really breaking below its 50-day moving average. Our Bill Maloney, who watches the technicals here at Bloomberg, saying that that was significant. He was watching it Friday. It held Friday going into the weekend, but that's not the case today. Having said that, Scarlett, as Romain mentioned, most names in the S&P 500 lower today. 424 to the downside, and you had about 76 gaining some ground today. Yeah. I was just looking at the VIX. It shot up to past 19 from 17 on Friday. So we're now at the highest level since last October when we had the last big sell-off. You're Looking there at the IMAP, and uh, when you break down the S&P 500 into 11 industry groups, all red all around, tech, real estate investment trust, and communication services leading the way. Um, the, the sectors that are doing fairly better or holding up a little bit better here are telecom services, household and personal products, and banks, but just marginally so. All yeah, right. And I just, sorry, but yeah, just before please. you move on to the individual movers, I just want to point out, I was looking it up, so the S&P on a two-day basis, this is the worst drop going back to uh, March of 2023 mm. in the middle of uh, the uh, regional bank crisis. Is the NASDAQ uh, worst two-day drop going back to October of last year. All right, so some significance, right, in terms of what we've seen mm -hmm. in a couple of days and that tone uh, and tenor in the S&P 500 and particularly the equity market. Having said that, was able to find a few gainers in today's session. Goldman Sachs, of course, out with earnings earlier today. At its highs, up 6%, folks, uh, finishing the day just shy of a 3% gain. Uh, really a standout among the big banks that have reported so far. Uh, Goldman, by the way, shares were the number two gainer in the S&P 500. Profit soaring 28%. You probably know this. Bucking analyst expectations of a drop. Fixed income traders surpassing even most optimistic uh, estimates. And we did get some upbeat comments about AI. David Solomon, the head of uh, Goldman, saying it expects uh, AI significant demand from AI-related infrastructure and, as a result, financing, which will be a tailwind to their business in particular. All right, uh, number two gainer in the S&P 500, another bank, and we're talking about M&T Bank soaring the most in, I believe, two years after boosting its 2024 outlook for net interest income. Of course, a key source of revenue. That's what we look at when it comes uh, to these banks. So M&T uh, Bank up uh, almost 5%, 4.7%. It was up, though, 8% at its highs today, so finishing off its best levels of the day. Intel, uh, looking at the chips today, uh, we did see a lot of chip names, uh, 
uh, chip names, excuse me, your top gainers in the NASDAQ 100. Intel, the number one gainer in the NASDAQ 100. City opening up a 30-day positive catalyst watch on the stock, saying Intel is experiencing negative sentiment due to the foundry businesses. We reported about this at Bloomberg in the last week or so. Um, but that given the positive March notebook data of a 44% month-over-month increase, there is upside to consensus estimates. So getting a little bit in the weeds, but nonetheless, they're upbeat city group that is on Intel. So that stock easily a standout in today's session. Okay, today. you had the hard job today, Carol. <laughs> I had the easy job finding decliners. Uh, quite a few notable ones, including Tesla, uh, finishing down by 5.6%. This after a Bloomberg reported that several top executives are going to be leaving the company, and there will be global job cuts at the company. In fact, the largest ever round of job cuts, reducing global headcount by more than 10%. Our team actually reporting that the cuts could reach closer to 20% in some divisions. Two people familiar with the matter told our own uh, Dana Hull and Ed Ludlow earlier today. Um, in addition, Senior Vice President Drew Baglino, who's an 18-year veteran of the company, just one of four named executives at the company, um, four named executive officers at the company, I should say, uh, he uh, announced today that he was leaving. Shares hitting the lowest since May of last year. Also falling today on a percentage basis, the worst performer in the S&P 500 goes to Salesforce, down the most since going back to uh, December 2022. Um, this after Bloomberg reported the company is targeting Informatica to boost data capability. That's according to several people familiar with the matter. Some analysts, though, noted that such a deal may draw regulatory scrutiny. Should note that Informatica shares also fell today by 6%, that uh, a software company. And uh, DJT, Trump Media and Technology, ticker DJT, of of course, Donald Trump's social media startup tumbling again today, this time uh, falling close to 20 percent on the day today. Um, this after the company took a first step toward allowing the former president and other insiders to capitalize on their stake. Uh, the company filed to register shares, including those linked to warrants, and that could ultimately bring forward sales from insiders that are not currently permitted until September. Read, perhaps President Trump. Um, we should note that now, uh, Former President Trump's net worth, has, uh, at least tied to this, has fallen from uh, more than $5 billion to uh, just over $2.1 billion in a few weeks. And I just want to point out a couple other big uh, yeah. decliners, uh, Ted. I'm, uh, Tim, I'm sure you saw it uh, with all of the crypto stocks moving lower. Bitcoin yep. now back down uh, below that 64000 Did you see level. crypto over the weekend, Romain? Um, I, I'm just going to surprise you, Tim, but I actually don't sit up <laughs> over the weekend looking at crypto. <laughs> but, but, it's, but what happened? <laughs> well, given, you know, it's, it's, you know, people thought it was a hedge against you know what could happen around yes, the world, yeah. um, and it ended up falling to what sixty two thousand Bitcoin over the weekend uh, on the uh, uh, strike from Iran. Yeah, on the week of the having. I was telling you, yeah. the was everything. Anyway, let's take a quick look at mm -hmm. what happened in the yield space, because that really was where a lot of the volatility was today here. You're looking at a 10-year yield right now, back at that 4.6 range, up about nine basis points on the day. The two-year yield, a smaller move, but nevertheless, at one point, it was just really just a tick or two away from hitting five. Remember, it was just what, back in early February, we were looking at a 10-year below four, and a two-year yield back in mid-January that looked like it was also going to break below four. So a huge reversal from where we were uh, at the start of this year when everybody thought the trajectory for yields was lower, lower, lower. People were going long duration, but the sell-off guys now continuing here for what would be a fourth straight week. All right, so that's significant, right? We care about these trend lines and what we see from week to week, so really important. Having said that, uh, a little bit of, I don't know, levity. Um, I will say this is one of the most read stories on the Bloomberg <laughs> Terminal. Uh, it's a Bloomberg opinion piece, and in the headline on it is why everyone in finance is getting ripped. It gets into uh, a Goldman Sachs uh, banker <laughs> over in London. He's 55 years old. He's got his own podcast. He goes by G-Dog. Uh, but it just talks about how we are seeing um, a lot of bankers who spend a lot of time doing their job, how they are now again, kind of branching out, looking to spend a little bit more time on their wellness. And you see top-notch fitness facilities at some of the banks uh, that are around the world. And so... Well, that's uh, an understatement. Did you see the pictures of that gym <laughs> that they have at Goldman? And I was like, I, mean, I was a little envious. I'm still right. looking, looking to have pretty, a gym I'm here. I'm pretty fancy. I'm still if looking I want for exercise, the gym. I just got to like roam, roam around You just want to be yeah. called our dog, yeah. don't you? <laughs> I, you know, I mean, it'd be nice to have a cool nickname. But, it um, could happen. But it's interesting, too, in, in all series of that story. Yeah. Yeah, there's been other stories that kind of written about this, how like just the tone of uh, just how things work on Wall Street, that the idea of taking people out for drinks yeah. and other things that were kind of commonplace has now shifted to more wellness activities, going for a run or taking people to the or gym. Or training with clients rather yeah, than going exactly. out for a martini or something. And that's because a lot of clients want that. Yeah. Well, it's a recognition that perhaps drinking and going to... Um, unsavory places is no longer the way of the street and <laughs> you, you can do other what things. What do you mean and by unsavory? <laughs> well, Scarlet. I mean, 
Uh, one part of the story that I really liked here is the idea that, you know, you could have uh, associates, you know, just out of college or perhaps even, uh, you know, folks who are interns working out next to managing directors or perhaps showing them, you know, interaction. How, how to do certain things. Do you even lift, bro? Me? No, I'm just like, oh, oh. Are they saying oh that wait, was gym? that for me or Scarlett? I'm a little confused here. Yeah, I don't know. We don't know who, who Tim was trying to diss there. I don't uh, but, call but Carol. We bro. should point out Tim's probably the fittest guy on the show. So uh, I mean, I know your all your client visits are probably what on the Peloton or something, right? Yeah, I don't know. yeah. I don't know. All right, Tim. We Tim's don't have a gym. I mean, when, when Tim Still started here, he invited, right, invited me over. And bros, like, it's a wrap. Like, no, apparently, like, no. <laughs> bro. All right, guys, that'll do for our cross-platform right, coverage. Sis. <laughs> no, no. Radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals, our family. We'll see you again, same time, same place tomorrow.